This is Melissa Lentz. I'm the Director of Education at OSEG, and I'd like to welcome you to our webcast today, during which we will present a great debate on ISO 31000 2018 versus COSO 2017 for Enterprise Risk Management. Today, global experts will discuss the strengths and weaknesses of the two leading official risk management frameworks covering everything from what's good, what's bad, what could or should be improved, how to cherry pick the best from both, which is most likely to be favored by regulators globally, and much more. So today we're joined by the following panel of experts. Norman Marks, who is an outspoken critic of the new CUSO 2017 ERM framework. Alex Sidorenko, participant in the development of ISO 31000, scheduled for release in 2018. Tim, provocative COSO critic, who in the past has endorsed the new COSO 2017 ERM framework. And Carl Switzer, co-founder and president of OSE. We are very pleased to have these panelists here with us today. Before the presentation, I'd like to take just a minute or two to go over a few housekeeping notes. First, in continuing education credit, we provide NASBA-approved CPE credit to you if you have an OSIG All Access Pass, which you, you can purchase individually or as part of a company subscription. The All Access Pass includes many benefits in addition to CPE credits for webcasts such as S to all OSEG resources and on-demand education series. So if you already have a pass, I would encourage you to check it out on the OSEG site. If you do access pass and would like a certificate of completion for CPE for this event, please be sure to stay with us for the entire hour and to answer all, all the polls. These are requirements for receiving CPE credit for this event. Second, starting the recording from this webinar. In just a couple of days, we will have the recording of this event posted on the OSEG website. Just log to the site, then go to the Events tab and select this webcast. The recording will be viewed by anyone with an all-access pass. Setting upcoming events and activities. Please watch your email for announcements from OSEG about other upcoming webinars. You can information about these upcoming webcasts on the OSEG site. We'll describe the key concepts behind the new ISO 31000, now in close to final form, and COSA 2017 Enterprise Risk Management Frameworks. We'll describe the strengths and weaknesses of risk management frameworks and share ideas on how to improve on existing frameworks and build your own customized approach to ERM. Uh, we are hosting a video seminar. Uh, there will be a slide deck for this event. It will just be video. And hopefully all of you can see the video in the upper right-hand corner of your WebEx panel. And if you can see that, there's a way to make the video presentation full screen by clicking on the arrows at the top of that video. So if you'd like to make the video larger, go ahead and click on those arrows now. And at this time, I would like to hand things over to our presenters to begin today. Thanks, uh, I'm really pleased to have this uh, esteemed group with us. Also, we're opinionated group, so this should be a great conversation. Um, uh, start. I'm going to ask Melissa to run our first poll while I'm doing our intro because we asked a couple questions at the beginning so we get our idea of who the audience is. But today we'll talk about these two key risk management standards or frameworks. And it's important to know that risk management standards really began to hit their stride in the mid 2000s and they largely in response to a lot of crises that have been going on. Um, this should be the poll, by the way, right up on top of the screen here. So I would answer that question about what your primary area of responsibility or role is. We can begin to address this conversation in the, in the context of what the audience probably needs. We're going to talk today about two of the primary risk management frameworks or set of standards that have been more prominent over the past decade. Some people do these as with each other. Certainly there are strong supporters of each. There are strong detractors of each. A uh, gentleman we have with us today have some support and some criticism of both of these frameworks. All of us, as many of you know, issued our first version of the GRC Capability Model, the Red Book, in 2004. At that time, we um, pulled from incorporating key aspects of risk management from many global and regional risk management uh, and governance standards. And we included the two that were, uh, one that we're talking about today and the precursor to the other. We 
focused on the Australia New Zealand standard, which was undergoing its own update in 2004. I think it had been first issued in the late 90s. Uh, that was the basis for the ISO 31000 standards that were later released in 2009. From COSO, both the internal control framework was first published in the early 90s, 92, and amended in 94. And then in 2004, COSO added in the COSO Enterprise Risk Management Framework as an extension, in effect, of the internal control framework. It was developed at the same time as the OSEC framework, and we collaborated quite a bit between each other. Uh, there was also an update to the internal control framework at that time, and it included a practice note that referenced the OSEC GRC capability model as operationalizing certain aspects of that framework. So we have a familiarity with these two sets of standards. Um, the standards uh, are just adopted by national um, standard organizations, and by the end of 2015, there were 57 countries who had standards organizations that had adopted ISO 31000 as their country's national standard for risk management. But on the side, because of the internal control framework, the original framework, uh, given a big boost in use when the U.S. Uh, Securities and Exchange Commission referenced it as, a, as an appropriate framework to use in response to Sarbanes-Oxley requirements. So we see the growth of these two uh, standards or frameworks uh, last decade, really, um, because of these activities that have gone on. The revision is underway for ISO 31000. COSO-RM released a revision in September of this year, and our participants will address those as well. We've reframed this discussion as a great debate, but it's not really that simple. There really are no clear-cut sides on this discussion. The issues are very complex, and they're very nuanced. Um, and so I'm going to kick off with some questions. I'm going to try to keep our speakers in the boundaries of the discussion topics that we've talked about, but I'm really going to let them, uh, you know, sort of think freely and discuss freely. I think it'll be more interesting for everybody. So, even in response to our poll, not everybody has answered this poll, but 58% of the people say their primary responsibility is risk management. So, I want to launch the second poll. And that is asking about whether your organization uses uh, either of these sets of standards today. While we're addressing that, I want to uh, start by asking each of our participants to tell us a little bit about themselves, what the background is with risk management and with the development of these frameworks. Um, you see, we're not just asking opinionated people, we're actually asking uh, experts who have some some real background and information to share. So let me start with Norman. Why don't you just spend a minute or two tell us about yourself and your background. Evans and hello everybody. What a privilege to to be on this uh, web with friends of mine, uh, Tim and, and Carol. So I've been I'm about five years, but I was uh, involved in internal audits prior to the 10 years of public accounting. But in terms of it, and then also as a chief risk officer, occasionally a compliance and ethics officer for large organizations. In this, I had to work with executives to help them run the business, not just put a list of risks. And up with our uh, client, I think in writing and blogging, and I was uh, recognized by the Institute of Risk Management as an honorary fellow. Colors, obviously, with uh, Tim. He and I are uh, fellows uh, of OSET, for which we are very, very much honored. I have a book um, on risk management, which is called World Risk Management. Carol mentioned 
the New Zealand standard. Well, I was privileged to have the operation in, in writing world class risk management of the chairman of that initiative, Grant Purdy, and also leading risk management thinkers around the world. So this area that I've pretty much focused on over the last five to ten years. And um, yes, I'm working it perhaps in my thinking, but I think I'm finding myself more and more in the majority uh, when it comes to some of these thoughts I have and, and, and I'm sharing on this management. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to the uh, to the webcast. And uh, my name is Alex Sidorenko. I've been in risk for over 14 years now and been very fortunate and lucky, I guess, to start my education and career in Australia, which was the birthplace of 4360, which later became the benchmark and the, 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 the uh, structure, the skeleton for the ISO 30,000. But I'm a passionate believer in principle-based risk management and linking risk with objectives in integrating risk management into uh, core activities and uh, decision making and uh, from sort of from uh, from probably two or three years ago I uh, heavily participate in the rough representation and the ISO 31000 update creating many of the comments that have been submitted for the review for TC262 the committee in ISO responsible for the updates of the guys that will be publishing this ended early next year, hopefully. Um, and the, over the kind of over the working career, working as the head of risk for one of the sovereign funds in Russia, and uh, now advising one of the sovereign funds in in the Middle East, is uh, it really uncovered a lot of fascinating things, a lot of challenging things, a lot of things that begin to question some of the traditional risk management approaches, some of the methodologies, some of the qualitative tools that historically been used by risk managers. And I believe there are much better ways to enter into decision making. And I think this is something that we will be sharing in this uh, interesting debate today as well. Tim, tell me about your background. Well, thanks for Carol, and, and thanks for inviting me. Uh, both Norm and I are OSEG fellows, so we uh, really value the participation with OSEG. Well, my career started, uh, I guess, with Gulf Canada in the 90s, and we launched thing that eventually became called risk self-assessment, which was really a, a form of enterprise risk. And the work did at Gulf in the 90s became, uh, it, it sometimes were referred to myself and my old boss, Bruce McQuaig, uh, the grandfathers of control risk self-assessment. Um, work was very uh, exciting at the time in golf, and, and later at, when I went into public practice, it, it got a lot of reception around the world. Uh, like Alex, I was working in, in Australia in the 90s, helping companies implement control risk self-assessment, and that had a the uh, Australia New Zealand 4360 had a big, big impact on, on my thinking. I thought it was one of the best pieces of work. Uh, and incredibly short, which is, is very, very powerful. Uh, unfortunately, COSO doesn't have that attribute. Um, it, the work I, when I went into public practice, uh, we started helping companies implement control risk self-assessment. Uh, we went into the software business and launched maybe arguably the world's first integrated enterprise risk software platform in 1997 called Carnap. Uh, we took it cloud in the year 2000 before people started calling it the cloud um, and we enabled it. And during the period though, uh, you mentioned the history of COSO and uh, I was followed that very closely starting the response when I was at Gulf to the Treadway exposure draft, which is where COSO came from. It was organized as the Treadway uh, Committee of Sponsoring Organizations and later became just COSO, and I've been a very outspoken critic of, of uh, uh, the COSO work products. The 1991 exposure draft of COSO, I was very positive, 
And a very important part of the exposure draft in 91 was, was that it was very close to what the COSO ERM framework is now. It talked about importance of setting objectives, uh, and, and had a number of other important attributes, and then the authors of COSO decided that defining and communicating objectives wasn't part of an integrated control framework, which I objected to quite violently, uh, in, in, as well as some other things that they did in the final 1992 version. Um, the, the COSO 2004 ERM product, uh, I was very much against because it emphasized what I call risk-centric ERM. So there's dozens of pictures of risk registers and risk profiles and risk heat maps. Uh, very little emphasis in my mind, although they referenced the word objective in their definition, uh, it really didn't receive the press that it should have in the final. Uh, but most recently, the uh, COSO uh, 2017 release, I've been very positive about because not because it's perfect by a long stretch, and, and people can read my ex comments to the exposure draft and my articles where I get into more detail about what I don't like. But I also like, but we do like a lot is the emphasis that risk management should be heavily linked to strategy of the corporation and important value creation uh, objectives, which is a very positive one for me. So I've been very Outspoken, uh, Richard Chambers was, uh, I, I think, maybe even shocked that, that I was as positive about a COSO work product. So that's a, a quick overview. Uh, we, we help companies around the world implement objective-centric ERM, which is using concepts from all of these frameworks. Yeah. So note on our second poll, about 22% of our participants say their organization is currently using the of COSO ERM, about 18% are using ISO 31000, about 3% are using both, and 24% say neither, they're not using them at all yet, so 7% don't know the answer to that question. So we have a, a, a pretty, you know, tip divide, I think, amongst the audience in terms of their knowledge and their familiarity with these frameworks. And the way for us to begin here is to really take a step back before we dive into the frameworks, their pros and cons, and talk about what you all think the key attributes or aspects of risk management should be for the future. You've taught us a little bit already, Tim, talking about being you know, our objective focus, which of course aligns with OSEC's view of performance, that the business should be seeking to reliably achieve objectives while addressing uncertainty and acting with integrity. So the risk management is in, in service of being able to achieve objectives. But we talk about what you guys think a risk management framework should should be and how it should contribute to the of the business. So I'll take about 15 minutes to talk about that. And then we'll move on to talking about how COSO ERM and ISO 31000 address or fail to address those attributes that you all think are important. So let's go Alex for maybe five minutes, then go to Norman and to Tim, and then you guys can, you know, have a little bit of exchange with each other on this topic as well. Sure, sure. sure. Thanks, Carol. Um, well, I don't think I will even take the five minutes. To me, it's really that it's really quite simple. Um, risk management to be effective, or the future of risk management, um, is to support decision making or any kind of activity associated with uncertainty at any level within the organization. What means is that because most decisions are happening at the management level, and it kind of goes down, uh, that's where most of the risk management efforts should be focused on. There are, of course, some board level decisions, but pretty insignificant in quantity or frequency compared to the management decisions that are happening every single day. So, to me, risk management to be effective for the future of risk management is to provide the support and the tools to have the decision makers day to day make decisions that are associated with uncertainty. 
And that includes planning, forecasting, um, maintenance planning, pricing, literally any kind of decision that is associated with high uncertainty and is material enough should be supported by some sort of risk analysis. So that, that, that is actually quite a significant implication on how to read both uh, framework, a COSO, and uh, the ISO standards. So that's number one to me. The second is uh, uh, much less much less important. This one is like 80%. 80 percent of the effort is to support the decision makers or support the activities that are associated with the uncertainty. The other five percent is uh, uh, like the other ten percent. Uh, the other ten percent is uh, to satisfy whatever the regulators, auditors, and literally any other external party wants to see. Risk management is not just an internal decision making tool. It's a quite a useful external facing corporate governance initiative that can be packaged uh, for regulators, stock exchanges, auditors, uh, state auditors, government agencies, and literally anything you can think of. And the final thing, the third key uh, to management success is that risk management, by showing proper risk management, it should actually save companies a lot of money on insurance and financing. And also make money through better um, be better pricing or decreased cost of uh, external financing. So the three things that are in my mind are the very important fundamental ideas of risk management is to support decision making at every level of the organization. And equally, we have to realize that decisions are not happening at just a strategic level. And the second is to satisfy whatever the regulators want to, want to see. Uh, that actually may mean that there will be two different risk management in a single organization. Because whatever is good for the decision makers may not necessarily be good for the regulators and the external parties and the auditors. It may be complex for them or it's too honest for them. I'm sure the management would appreciate the full transparency and disclosure of uh, information to the external external world. And final one, risk management key way that actually saves a lot of money for the company and helps them make money by reducing the cost of financing or insurance. So those are three, my three things. Alex, I pretty much agree with you, and, and I think you, you and I spent a fair time uh, walking around Moscow talking about this. So here's my view. It's all about helping patients succeed. What does success mean is achieving your objective? of just there to deliver the value that your stakeholders need. Well, your objectives, and as Tim said, that is covered, and he will disagree on whether it's covered well or not, uh, Koso, but you have to set the objectives and then you have to achieve them. Well, on that to achieving objectives, this might happen. And about what might happen. And it's only what might happen and being able to do something about it, to take advantage of the good opportunities, minimize uh, the, the things that might go wrong, that risk management is all about. In fact, risk management is all about helping the company and its executive team succeed. It's not about failure. It's about being success. And that, I think, is, is a really key concept that we get by. It is not about avoiding failure. It's about having success. Now, who's done some really good work in this area, and I like their risk intelligence series. Did a study ask executives and board members about the provided by risk management? I think percent of them said that risk management in their organization helps them set and then execute on strategy. That's pathetic. 80% says risk management is actually helping them succeed. Term initiative under Ms. Beasley at North Carolina State University. And he's been deciding to the maturity of risk management. Ten years ago, you know, percent of organizations said they had mature risk management, whatever that means. Rolling years, so this last year, gone substantially from 3.4 to 5%. Somewhere, 
risk management is not being seen as effective, it's not being seen as mature and effective by risk practitioners at their organization, by and large. And part of that is because when the executives don't see it as delivering value, they don't provide their attention, they don't provide resources. Therefore, the risk officers are not able to deliver what they see as necessary. So where does it connect? This, in my view, is that how we achieve risk in order to achieve objectives. But it's more of, are we taking the right risk? Are we taking the right level of the right risks? Because you don't seek to avoid risk. You have to take risk in order to succeed. But is that intelligently? Are you doing that in an informed fashion after understanding what might happen, the good, the bad, the likelihood of this outcome, the likelihood of that consequence, both good and bad? Then being able to make, as Alex said, the right decision. So in practice, you achieve so you achieve objectives by making the right decisions. And be an emphasis enabling people to make intelligent and informed decisions, which lead to the right risk, so therefore you're able to achieve your objective. Recently, let's also say from time to time, you need to produce a list of risk to communicate to the outside world, regulators and also stakeholders who are concerned with things like questions, how risky is the company, whatever that means. Now, a period of taking stock, as John Frey, my friend, uh, is, is useful because some of these risks continue for a long period of time and it's a good idea to understand where they, where they are, whether they're at acceptable levels, they may affect multiple objectives, and you need to know whether they're being managed properly, whether you're prepared in the event that some of them might actually come to pass. But too many organizations ask all they do. All they do is reduce a list of risks. And which my friend Jim DeLoach of Productivity calls enterprise risk management rather than enterprise risk management. And, and managing a list of risks, managing a list of what could go wrong, is not enabling an organization to succeed. And therefore, you leave this disconnect with the executives. They don't have attention, they don't give them resources. Risk money is not seen as added value, and it goes there. So, as I the the ERM update, and now the ISO 31000 update, what I'm looking for is not a gradual improvement to step improvement, but how we move the practice from being fine mature and 80% seen as adding value to the execution of strategy to being better 50, 70, 80% in practice. How can we move the practice to enable success rather than avoiding failure? That's my, that's uh, what I like to see. What do you think, Tim? Uh, I, I think the one that needs to be communicated to all the participants is that uh, I think the reality is is that myself, Alex, and Norman all, all share similar ideas about the, the need for risk management to about to be about better achieving the objectives of the business, and I think it's important perhaps to put in the caveat that. It really needs to be the long-term objectives of the organization uh, because sometimes short objectives uh, get prioritized to, to the detriment of, of the organization, and that's happened in some of the major governance failures where objectives that were operational, whether they were the written ones or not, became a big problem. Uh, in, in terms of Carol, my philosophy has been heavily influenced by the need to get the entire organization engaged in, in thinking about objectives, thinking about risks, thinking about the way the risks are being treated, and trying to, to make better decisions on whether enough risks are being taken, too many risks are being taken, uh, to and including the board. So a mantra that I have promoted for probably over 20 years is an uh, enterprise risk system um, should, be, 
should ab about seek consensus agreement on, on on the risk, but all the notion that risk I mean, is something we all do. We, we do it in our personal lives and people that run businesses. All the people in the organization are, are, are engaged in managing risks every day, and that's been a message I've communicated. The real difference that shaped my career is, is the need for people to understand that you can apply structured rigor in the form of the tenets of risk management to do a better job. Uh, increasing certainty you will achieve and get what you want and you won't get what you don't want and hence my, my passion for risk self assessment o over the last 25 30 years is, is really to escalate what we do every day now risk into a discipline that brings a little more structure a little more rigor and once we get into the large public companies, the institutional investors are calling on more transparency. Uh, they want confidence that the senior executive uh, suite and, and the board are doing a good job managing the, the risk to the organization and, and the organization at a level of retained risk that, that the board is comfortable with. So that has shaped things in, in recent years. And uh, Alex mentioned the credit rating agencies. Uh, the regulators, I think, are slowly becoming more sophisticated. Uh, I have to admit, I blame many of the regulators for the proliferation of risk lists around the world, because many of the regulators appear to have decided that that's just fine and constitutes effective risk management, which is a travesty. So I think we need our regulators to raise their games and understand, as we mentioned earlier, good management is about thoughtful risk taking and, and good decision making and better allocation of resources to better manage the organization. So those are key philosophies uh, and, and certainly when I'm looking for what are the attributes of, of, a, of a, an effective risk framework, it's like to see the evidence that people are clear on what needs to be achieved, that they're thinking about risks that could uh, in the, threaten those, and also what doing to treat it, and are, are they feeling okay about the level of retained risk? And, that, and that's something that can't happen quarterly or annually. It has to happen uh, real time. So what I want to do now is take these points that you guys have made about the, the need for effective risk management to actually support decision making, day to day decision making, support achievement of objectives and determination about objectives, or just making a risk register and list of risks that you presumably can address but may not really address. So let's into really talking about how COSO ERM and ISO 31000 address if they do, the desired attributes and how they compare to each other. What are their key differences, their similarities, what are the weaknesses of each, how the recent updates and post updates. We'll talk let's talk about the updates separately, you know, uh, in the next in the next section. But let's Let's focus on you know, what what work doesn't work with these frameworks and, and standards in the, in the context of this focus we want to have on actually being able to make better risk decisions. So let's move this up a little bit. Let's start with Norman and then go to Tim and then to Alex this time around. Sure. Thank you. Just to capture Tim, this is one of the areas where you and I uh, see quite a lot of uh, have quite a lot of agreement, but there are some important differences, I think. But anyway, coming back to to COSO, so COSO is an improvement. COSO year in 2004 is in many respects than the original COSO year in product. 
And I think the perhaps the greatest movement was uh, getting rid of that queue. I when I would talk about uh, ERM, which I, I do on a very frequent basis, I would ask how many people are familiar with the ERM queue. And a lot of people put their hands up. And then I asked them if they could explain it. And every single hand came back down again. Because it, it didn't make any sense. Now they've got a new approach, but it's, a, but it's not what it needs to be to move the practice we're making. COSA enabling decision making, improving the quality of decision making. But it's not good. In fact, in the very first sentence enough of the entire COSO um, framework. But there's striking not a single principle. So COSO has 20 principles for effective risk management. Not a single one mentions decision making. And I think all three of us have talked about the fact that decision making is at the core and taking the right level of risk. So that the, the the really important things for me. Um, the answer is, Tim, you talk about risk lists. And I, I need to congratulate COSO for eliminating any discussion of risk registers in the framework. On the other hand, they've introduced the term of an inventory. Well, the difference, COSO? Okay, and, and I have to say that many people involved in COSO are personal friends of mine from the chairman down through many of the, uh, the people involved. But I think that they have moved the, um, the enough change practice. And, and uh, as, as one of my, my I guess he his name, uh, but, uh, one of the people involved in one of the participating organizations who was actually at the table said, described, um, what COSO is encouraging as risk hunting. Risk is still risk centric. So I understand um, why we are not objective centric or centric. And, and, and I think that's missing. Now, if you turn to, by, by, by contrast, ISO, it has any hands, it's my business. It has very strong principles and guidance about decision making. This is the one of the eleven principles in quality of decision making. So very good. On the other hand, it doesn't tackle the issue of risk appetite. Uh, that was a lived decision in 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 uh, the uh, original version, and I'm sure it's being particularly well addressed in the update. So enabling the board to understand the real success in managing risk is really not well addressed. But both of them missed something from me. That is, if you're organization and you're trying to achieve an objective, you know, well, because all the things that might happen, all these risks, or opportunity, if you like, what's the likelihood of being successful? Take each of you, likelihood of success. Overall, taking all these things into account, and neither one of them touched that. And I do that because that is absolutely core to manage any organization or any part of the organization is knowing where I stand. Now, I want to point out one thing which I found out quite recently is that a lot of companies, technology as well as manufacturing companies, and now have decision-making framework. And I need everybody to go and do some research on decision science and decision analysis because there's and all that the risk management people could learn from the way done on decisions. Yeah, that, that's, that's really interesting, um, Norman. I think the focus on decision making, or lack of focus especially, is, is important. Alex, uh, what do you think about, about these, these two things? And by the way, we have an audience question I, I also want to throw out in this context. Uh, more, more of a comment than a question, one person said, I have the impression that COSO and PC262 uh, do not talk to each other. Instead of creating complementary rather than competing uh, management frameworks. I, I 
know you probably all have uh, opinions about this, but talk to you about it. I actually been told by the chairman of TC262 that uh, ISO have made numerous attempts to get uh, COSO to the table and share, you know, drafts and ideas and discuss and all of it. Um, which was, to, uh, what, is, what is TC262? That's another committee that is responsible for the update of ISO 3000. It's a technical TC262. Um, so, so the, the, apparently, that's what Adjun said. Uh, Koso has numerous times ignored the invite and uh, chose to go chose to go its uh, its own way. Uh, so I guess part of the reason I so did want to have that discussion. That there are some people, especially from US, uh, who is on both committees, the I and Koso, and they did the best they possibly could to try and align. Uh, to methodologies or frameworks or standards uh, obviously didn't work that well. Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't know why PwC chose that uh, lonely wolf role uh, as opposed to um, kind of all-in friendly. Um, they did, I mean, to, in all honesty, PwC did do quite a lot of effort to collect comments from uh, from the public. Um, or, or, you know, it's probably nothing compared to Close to like 5,000 comments received by ISO from uh, um, I think 70 something, 70 plus countries. Um, but anyway, there was an attempt, not sure really, it really worked that well. Um, but if I may now switch to your uh, comments, and before I hand it over to Tim, very briefly on pluses and minuses, uh, um, versus ISO. Uh, exactly, basically, what, what Norman was saying is that. If, we, if we're saying risk management is a decision-making tool, then uh, surely decision needs to be more prominent in the actual, uh, uh, in the actual framework, um, which is what, what uh, update is they attempting to do because it literally, on every single page, there's now a reference to integrating into core activities and decision-making. On 13 pages of a document, the making is mentioned 17 times. So I'm integrated even more than that. Uh, the challenge I have with ISO, so, so they they went much further than COSA did in terms of many uh, decision making and integrating into core activities, activities their vocal points. The, the challenge I have with ISO is that there's actually just as like as, as Norman said. There's over 70 years of research in decision making, in decision quality, uh, in uh, risk perception and cognitive biases into how humans make and behave under uncertainty. There's actually a lot of science in that. Um, for some completely bizarre reason, even though we from the Russian perspective try to raise it every single time, the authors chose to recreate the bicycle, reinvent the wheel, and ignore some of the uh, uh, some of decision making theory, and kind of they really stuck with that traditional risk message of identify, assess, mitigate, and monitor, and report and communicate, which is not how decisions are made. There is a different sequence of events to dip, to analyze the risk as part of decision making, which is wonderfully described in a lot of books on decision theory. Um, so, I'm not entirely sure why the kind of the ISO went halfway to decision making, but didn't really adopt the proper science uh, behind it. Uh, well, also, I have a lot more issues because remember when I mentioned there are two risk managements, one for the decision makers, one for the corporate governance, um, and decision make, one for the decision makers, that's where you spend 80% of your time, and the corporate stuff, which is just nice to have, and you get like, you, you beautiful reports to share to everyone. Um, 20 most, well, I think COSO really went full on on the corporate governance stuff. They think I've, I've read the full document and that was so painful. Uh, again, because I've read the 2004 version and my God, you do not have to put so much um, just feel good slogans and just basic like Captain Obvious text in the in the document. Some of the things I just, you know, way over the top. It's like preaching to children. 
Um, and most of the examples are just plainly naive because that's not how life works. Um, you know, people, that's not how business makes decisions. Business is not, you know, this wonderful, nice fairy cloud. Um, anyway, they, um, COSO went all out, all out on a lot of corporate governance stuff that you should have roles and responsibilities and so on and so on. So on. But if you distill that down to the risk, actually, probably 80% of the COSO frame, the new version, is not about risk management. It's about corporate governance stuff in general, um, which is a wonderful textbook, probably, if you're interested in corporate governance. But the actual core message about risk is interesting because it's very contradictive. On one, they actually mention a lot about cognitive biases and how human nature has to be taken into account. Uh, they also mention a whole variety of tools that are applicable, and some of the tools actually used in decision making, like decision tree sensitivity scenarios, Monte Carlo simulations, uh, and more advanced artificial intelligence. It gets a mention in the document, but the document is written is actually for qualitative risk assessments, which are fundamentally flawed. There should be quite a lot of research to suggest that any kind of risk analysis that is done based on opinions qualitatively is fundamentally flawed in its design and is actually producing not just vaguely incorrect but significantly incorrect decision making inputs for the for the executives. Uh, so there was a comment I saw, a wonderful comment in the in the chat about risk profile. Uh, I, I thought the whole concept of risk profile was completely uh, completely ridiculous. Um, it's basically a qualitative risk assessment which goes through exactly the same fundamental design flaws as any heat map does and ignores the, all of the research in the probability theory, ignore, ignores basic laws of mathematics, and uh, ignores all of the research that we've done, we've achieved so far in, in decision making, um, which I, I feel so disappointed about because, you know, it's so many years in the making and you're expecting kind of a leapfrog into the future and, and yet you see just a, a new way to represent the same fundamentally flawed information in a more beautiful picture. Um, we, is that the best we a community can do? Uh, I just don't think so. Yeah, I'm like Tim's Russian twin now. <laughs> so I'll turn to Tim and, and let him uh, spend some time too. I will leave him. We, we have another comment from the audience saying, You know, the panel finds risk appetite setting by the board easy to talk about, but that it loses um, its value or it just becomes sort of garbled or loses relevance within lower levels of the operation. This seems to be missing both guidance documents. I know that's a, a point that Norman feels um, strongly about. And also, Tim, I want to say, Somebody has noted that I-31000 differentiates between the concept of a risk management framework and risk management processes, but COSO kind of mixes those two things together. So you know, I heard Alex saying a lot was they raise ideas, one of corporate governance and the other of decision making, but then totally fail to actually I just want to address the original question. Uh, more from, uh, I think what Alex and, and Norman have been doing has been technical analysis of, of failings in these frameworks. And I think one of the, the frameworks have is they don't clearly articulate what is the purpose of the framework is, and neither of them. Uh, I'm not convinced either of them are measuring whether their efforts as framework setters actually are achieving whatever it is intended to do if they, if they would ever disclose that clearly. I mean, COSO was originally created to reduce the, fraud, the incidence of fraudulent financial reporting. Well, you can measure that 
in a variety of ways. And, and since COSO was created in the late 80s, uh, the frauds have escalated. They haven't decreased. So if that was their purpose, uh, I'm not convinced that, that they've done that well on that. I think both of the organizations suffer from a lack of clarity on what are the objectives uh, of the initiative of of defining and communicating ideas, which is what all of them, that all either of them are doing. Um, they both suffer, though, and, and you've you touched on it. So, or Alex mentioned that COSO, COSO is moving closer to a management framework. Neither of them want to say that it's a management framework, but really, activity of defining objectives and working towards them is, in fact, management. And both of these frameworks, and, and even arguably the old internal control framework that COSO built that was called integrated control, they're really about managing uh, organized enterprises. And my towards what made me positive about COSO 2017 is the pragmatist in me. I believe some combination of regulators, COSO and ISO, caused everybody to believe that ERM is doing uh, risk lists and, and writing heat maps and risk profiles. And I'm positive about COSO 2017, not because I think it's perfect, and I don't believe it's perfect for a lot of reasons, including some that Alex and, and Norman have also commented on, but what I like about it is at least it takes a stab at trying to correct the global perception that ERM uh, is about risk lists. Our last poll, because this hour has gone incredibly fast, and we just need to ask people if they like PPE kit for this event. So we won't show the results of this poll, but we'll leave it open you all the answer. And I uh, turn to Norm, I have to say, we have, we have a term, you know, quite a lot of questions from the audience. This is obviously a really hot topic. Um, I think I heard from all of you that there are some good nuggets in both of these uh, frameworks or standards, but neither of them are something that you can just take and apply to the exclusion of other uh, risk management and decision-making activity in your organization. So, Norman, I want to just close out by asking you, what the heck should people do with these frameworks and standards? <laughs> well, I think that both were we can use them to, you know, hold up uh, short legs. They're both uh, useful uh, to, to win and understand and some of the things that they have to, to say worth absorbing. Uh, I think still that the, the principles are, the, are those that will be found in, in I.O. and looking to evaluate your management activity. And I don't want to work with management framework. This is about how well do you manage risk, how well do you achieve success, how well do you achieve objectives within your organization. I think the ISO principles are the way to go, but the ISO framework is not complete, as I think all of us will will recognize. Um, I think the um, the, the most uh, insight I can add is that, you know, in 2015, I wrote my book, World Class with, with Management, uh, forward, work, forward by um, the, the godfather, the, the, the parent of, of Australian New Zealand 4360, Grant Purdy. And with uh, advice from people around us and, and work with management, I let them say, Do I need to update this after so 2017? And the answer is no. Um, the, practice, the best practices out there on risk management are well ahead of even these today. So I think should we should really understand these? Um, read the books that are out there, look, listen to the case studies. Uh, for example, there's some excellent books by John Fraser, uh, ERM, and there's some other ones really very good out there. So, learn as much as you can, talk to as many people as you can, network around the world as I have, um, and be 
But it comes down to, to one question for every scope officer, every practitioner, and every other auditor, which is, am I helping the organization succeed? Or am I simply focusing on a list of potential sources of failure? Am I helping them avoid failure? Because if, you, if all you do is seek to avoid failure, you will. You need to know how can I make them make better decisions, understand what happened, and succeed. Yeah, that is uh, certainly the OSEC point of view. You, your focus is beyond reliably achieving your objectives while addressing uncertainty. And, life and uh, acting with integrity. Alex, I, I think I, I think we'll have to schedule another webcast where we can just talk about the issue of decision making, how people make decisions in risk, and how that happens throughout the organization at every level. Guys would also be interested in joining us for that, but I think that uh, we don't find that in the frameworks and the standards, and it's probably the most important piece the public. So I thank you all for your time and for your great thoughts. Uh, this has been an interesting uh, opportunity for us to do this kind of video cast and, and I, I'll get feedback from our audience and we'll see if we can do it again. Thank you everybody. Have a great day. Thank you Carol. Carol.